People say you can't change your career at 30, that's when you're meant to be settling down. You can't change your career at 35, you should have had it figured out by then. Oh my God, you're not married at 38? What the hell are you doing with your life? Who comes up with this stuff? I have no idea. But this stuff plagues so many people that I speak to. So many people open up to me and say, Jay, I just don't know how to change. Is it possible? What do you think this guy was before he became who he is? He used to be a PE teacher, right? Sports teacher at a high school. How about her? She was a telemarketer for two weeks. How about her? She applied to be a funeral director. It's incredible. What happens in society is that we're clouded by the noise, the noise of family expectations, the noise of our parents, the noise of our brothers and sisters' expectations. I grew up in a family where you could either be a doctor, a lawyer, or a failure, right? Those were my three options. Anything else would just count me as a failure. I would have failed, so basically I failed, right? I'm standing up here in front of you all as a failure. I lived as a monk for three years. I committed career suicide. I turned down two amazing corporate job offers when I graduated from business school. I shaved my hair, I wore robes, and lived out of a gym locker for three years. And I did that because I thought I was gonna do something meaningful, help impact the world. And it was one of the best experiences of my life. But more than becoming a monk, what that trained me to do was drop out with the rules. People told me, if you come back in three years, you never get a job. They told me, if you become a monk, people are gonna think you're weird forever. No girl's ever gonna talk to you. People told me, they were, like, they were like, well, when you come back to real life, like, will you even be able to talk English? And like, people were just really weirded out. I was just like, okay, I think monks speak English. And there was so much different noise that I was hearing when I made that decision. And the funny thing is, from having not been a monk for four years now, I'm in one of the most incredible periods of my life that I could ever have asked for. And so much of that is based on the fact that I decided to do something different. So many of the times our expectations are driving us in a certain scenario. We focus so much on life in what we want to be as opposed to who we want to be. Because we've always been told that life and jobs and careers are like boxes and containers. There's only a finite number of options. There is no formula, there is no pattern. If you know what you're passionate about, if you know what you're good at and you invest in that. People say follow your passions, I say forget that, invest in your passions. If you're passionate about something, go and become the best at it. Go and do a course on it. Go and learn from the best. Go and find a mentor who's gonna make you incredible at that trait. Not only will you be criticized and grow, you'll be able to find new things about yourself that you never knew. Don't trade who you are for who you think the world needs because the world needs you to be you and I mean that. I was a 19 year old kid and I was miserable. I was in love with my high school sweetheart. We were that couple that was really annoying. So we went to school together. We signed up for classes together. We shared a U-Haul on the way to school together. We lived in the same dorm together. We walked to class. We walked to breakfast in the morning and walked to class together. I mean, we were just joined at the hip and we were completely crazy infatuated in love. And then halfway through the first year of college, she, discovered beer and other boys on the same night and she cheated. I completely fell apart. I stopped going to class. I barely ate anything, certainly nothing healthy. I stopped studying. I just stopped caring about the world. Literally couldn't get out of bed. And I never thought about it until years later, I, uh, reading changed my life because I was still reading. It was one thing that's brought me through everything. And I happened to pick up the school newspaper and I opened it up and there was this full page ad. It was this perfect white sandy beach, turquoise water, big green palm tree. And across the top of the ad, it said, escape. <laughs> Students needed for summertime jobs in the Dominican Republic. So I escaped, I went down there. And one night my friend, Kevin, and I, we hopped into a car after uh, dropping off a client. So we're going down this road, 85 miles an hour in this car, and the windows were open and that air was coming in. That amazing humid, if you've been in the Caribbean, that just gorgeous, amazing humid air is coming in. And then we came upon a corner. We take that corner 85 miles an hour, and that corner became the turning point that put my feet on the stage for you today. Kevin grabs the wheel, and he goes, hold on, and I brace. 
and the car starts sliding sideways and that weird slow motion thing happens. Kevin's gripping the wheel, trying to make the corner and all of a sudden, smack. When I came to, I looked over and Kevin is screaming at the top of his lungs, get out of the car, Brendan, get out of the car. And I look over and a whole big chunk of his head is open. So I pull myself out of the windshield of this car and he's screaming over here and I stand up eventually on the hood of the car and I look and I notice all this blood on me and I remember just looking down and that slow motion thing's happening. I just thought, did I even matter? And I start seeing all these images of my life when I'm surrounded by people that I care for. There's a cake in front of me. Here's my friends singing. My mom leading him in that goofy song. There's my sister, just swinging and smiling right next to me. And it makes you wonder, did I love? Did I love openly and honestly and completely? Or did I hold back because that one time I got hurt? And just as I was about to pass out, I noticed a, a glint, like a, a sparkle some shiny, a reflection in the blood going off the hood of the car and it made me look up. And there was this bright, big, beautiful moon that night. And I just immediately felt this connection if, like I knew I was gonna be okay. And I felt like the big guy upstairs reached down to me and handed me life's golden ticket. He reached down and said, here you go, kid. You're still alive. You can still love and matter. But now you know the clock is ticking. Mortality, motivation. I got it as a 19 year old kid. People say, why are you so successful? I'm like, I got mortality motivation when I was 19. That's a blessing. Most people don't get that till they're 60. Don't worry, Kevin and I, we both survived. See, I'm still here. <laughs> it's okay. I made it. But the one thing that I took away from that entire thing was that moment and those questions, because I remembered them. And I thought about them as I was healing. I was like, what was that about? Why did I feel so unhappy with that moment? Because I thought, you know, in the last moments of life, there must be this transcendence and I was not happy. And I realized it was because of how I'd been living my life and I wasn't living to my questions. I knew I got those questions. Did I live? Did I love? Did I matter? And soon as I got that those were the questions I'm gonna evaluate myself with at the end of the life, it gave me the power of what my late mentor Wayne Dyer taught, the power of intention. That breath you just took, feel it. <sighs> what a blessing that is you got that life. What a blessing is you got that breath. That means you still got something inside. You got to work for it. You got to contribute for it. You got to give for it. You got to lead for it. You got to love for it because you still have something not just in you. You're still here for a reason. And now you just got to earn that blessing. Nor my parents' biggest frustration was that I was epically lazy. And if they handed out gold medals for being lazy, I would have won, I assure you, hands down. Because even though I was a slightly chubby kid growing up in a morbidly obese family in Tacoma, Washington, I always knew two things about myself. One day I was gonna be rich and I was gonna have six pack abs. Like those are the two things is that kid that was, you know, jiggling his belly thinking one day I'm not gonna have to suck in my gut. When I left for college, my own mother, who'd always been my biggest cheerleader, quietly assumed I was going to fail. But these two guys that were successful entrepreneurs and bodybuilders happened to walk into a class when I was a teacher. And they were just starting a technology startup and they said, hey, we need a copywriter. Why don't you come be a copywriter? And so I was just young enough and just dumb enough and I went all in. They literally put me in the room with all the computer servers. But starting from there, I knew I could wow people because I was willing to grind it out. And we all have a superpower and my superpower may be the willingness and ability to endure suffering I had suffered a lot. I hadn't taken a day off in like six and a half years because I was so hell bent to get rich. And then I realized almost eight and a half years in, I'd finally had enough. I had hit my breaking point from suffering and I got so mad and I was so unwilling to do it anymore. And then I turned to my partners and I say, I'm completely miserable, I quit. 
I realized the reason I was living the cliche of money can't buy happiness. Along the way, had become so myopically focused on this promise I had made my, to myself as a kid that I never stopped to ask, why do I want to get rich? The questions you ask yourself will determine the course of your life. I had been asking myself, what do I need to do to get rich? And it left me really unhappy. So I changed the question and I started asking, what would I do and love every day even if I were failing. Life is too short, this is your one go round. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna build a company that's predicated on value. We're gonna build a company that's predicated on passion. I started thinking about my mom and my sister, but they were profoundly overweight. I started thinking about my uncle who ate himself to death when I was 12 years old and how much that scared me and it made me sad. And it made me sad to see that there were millions, if not more than a billion people that were in the same kind of abusive relationship with food that my mom and my sister were. So I said, I don't know if it's a big business, but I know it's a big problem. And that's the problem that we're going to solve. And so we decided to build a totally new kind of company. We started Quest Nutrition in 2010, just as we were coming out of the Great Recession. I was wearing a hairnet and a lab coat every day and my employees were former gang members, ex-drug dealers, felons. We were in Compton and we literally told everybody in the neighborhood, I don't care if you've been convicted of a crime. I just want to know if you're willing to bust your ass to change your life. And if you are, you're gonna get an interview. And I'm not gonna ask for your resume. I don't care about your resume. Your resume tells me where you've been. It doesn't tell me the price you're willing to pay to become somebody new. Every belief that you have is a choice. I choose to believe that human potential is nearly limitless. And this was the belief that changed my life. Because once I realized, so it's not about who you are today. It's about who you want to become and the price you're willing to pay to get there. And I promise you, the day that you're willing to pay any price, you'll achieve what you want to achieve. If you truly believe that human potential is limitless, what do you want to become? And what price are you willing to pay to get there? Gives you better sex. Increases your good cholesterol. Gives you more friends. Gives you more meaning, engagement, life satisfaction, and happiness. If you have a purpose-driven life, it adds years to your life. You live longer. Let me share two stories with you. Story number one, we're interviewing one of those school teachers. She says, the first year I taught was heaven. The second year I taught was hell. I had five boys that second year, and they were incorrigible. And there was one kid in particular. He was impossible. One day, this kid's in the doorway of the classroom and he's kicking and moving his arms and making noises and I lost it. He, she said, I'm ashamed to say these words. But I walked towards that kid with the intention of kicking him. Thank heavens he got up and ran away. I kept walking. I went to the principal's office. I said, this is it. It's him or me. And the principal took the kid out. She said, I felt terrible. So I went to two of my colleagues and poured my heart out. And they said to me, you are not the key to every door. And as she said those words, she burst into tears in the interview. And we waited a long time. And then she looked up and said, I hated that. Those words, you can't be the key to every door. She said, so I decided to become the key to every door. Instead of pushing disruptive kids away, I began to seek them out. I began to bring them into my world. I read every book I could find. I kept notes. I ran experiments. I kept notes on the experiments. And then she kind of pulled herself up and said, today, I am the key to every door. When there's a disruptive, troubled kid in the school, they say, give her to Miss so-and-so. She seems to know what to do with them. That's a profoundly important story. It's a story of transformative learning. When I have a higher purpose, I find the energy and the courage to go outside my comfort zone. Now the second story is a lot closer to home. I once had a daughter. 
She was single. She was living in Washington, D.C. She had reached that point in life where she said, there's none, not a good man left on the earth. And then she found one and she got really excited. Relationship grew. And then one day our phone rang. She's talking to her mother and I know what's going on. This guy just dumped her. This daughter is the firstborn child. Many firstborn children share a common characteristic. If they're miserable, they want you to be miserable too. Okay? And she said, I'm coming home this weekend. I thought, oh, no, no. Her mother hangs up and says, you're the father. You go to the airport and pick her up. I, oh, so the next day I go pick her up. She gets in the car and she doesn't say, hello, how are you? She says, that no good, dirty, da, 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 da. Five minutes later, she takes a breath. And I said, are you problem solving or purpose finding? We're finally pulling in the driveway. She takes another breath. I say it again. She says, what are you talking about? And she said, this is the real world. I said, well, I think it applies to the real world. By then we're in the house. I pull out a sheet of paper out of my file, and it says, Robert Quinn, life state. She looks at it. And then she grows kind of quiet. And she looks up and says, when you feel bad, you read this? I said, no. When I feel bad, I rewrite it. It's been rewritten hundreds of times. She said, yeah, I can hardly understand some of this stuff. I said, yeah, it's written to a customized audience, one person. Then the first miracle happened. She said, do you think I could write one of these? And I said, I'm sure you can. She went in the bedroom. For a day and a half, she worked on her life state. But the miracle was, I did not have to suffer during that day. <laughs> right? She got on the plane. She flew home uh, to DC. A couple days pass, I get an email. She said, he called me. Oh, this will be interesting. And she says, so I wrote him this letter. And I'm reading this letter that she's attached. It's incredibly vulnerable, open, honest. And then at the bottom it says, and my roommate said I can't give this to him. Now that's an interesting thing. Why can't we give this letter to this guy? You don't tell some guy that dumped you that, you know, here's how you feel. And then she said, what my roommates don't understand is that what he thinks doesn't matter. Whoa, wait a minute. A few days ago, what he thought caused her life to shatter. Now she's saying, what he thinks doesn't matter. She's saying, this is who I really am. Didn't know this a while ago. Now I know it. It doesn't matter what other people think. You see, when you clarify your purpose, you take back your external locus of control where you worry about what other people think, and you take an internal locus. You don't become insensitive. You don't become rebellious. You become centered. You become powerful. Now, here's the interesting thing. In the next few months, she began to be promoted. Her career turned. Why? This was a dating breakup. Why is her career taking off? Because when you find purpose and meaning in what you're doing in one area of your life, it grows in every area of life because you are one person. That company had a woman coming in with the same dresses on, body looked the same, but it wasn't the same employee. This was a woman now full of leadership for the first time. When someone has that meaning and that integrity, things start to change. The research says when you give up self-interested goals, where most of us are most of the time, and you take on contributive goals, you function differently. The biology changes. The thought process changes. Learning accelerates. You grow more. The only thing that I'm left to conclude is you and I are designed to be purpose-seeking mechanisms. You've been shaped by life. You've had bad experiences and good experiences. And both the bad experiences and the good experiences are there to teach you something about you. And if you look very carefully at those, 
you can determine what your purpose is. Every person in this room can clarify the purpose of their life, become the key to every door. Mike screamed, grenade out, and jumped on it, and boom! Two snipers were providing overwatch for the other platoon that were trying to maneuver. And unbeknownst to Mike and those guys, an insurgent had seen where they were firing, had snuck up next to the side of that building, pulled out a hand grenade, pulled it, and threw it up, and that thing came right up, boom, and hit Mike on the chest. Petty Officer Mike Monsoor took the entirety of that blast in his face and his chest. He lasted for another 35 minutes before he passed away on the medevac bird out. The kicker of this story is there was a stairwell right next to Mike, right next to him. And all he had to do was jump down that stairwell to save his own life, but he didn't. He turned and jumped on the grenade, sacrificing himself so his two brothers could both go home and hug their wives, kiss their children, and fight another day. I want you to think to yourself, what would you do? For 70 years, United States Navy SEAL team, we've been pushing the envelope, we've been setting the bar, we've been setting the standard for what the team life is and how you should live. Are you really committed to yourself physically? Because we all know when the going gets tough, the more in shape, the more focused you are on what you eat and what you consume, the better you are. I spent uh, 15 months in the frigid waters of the Pacific Ocean, to the mountains of Afghanistan on seven different occasions, and to the shores of Haiti doing missionary work with my church. And what I've learned in this incredible journey are a few undeniable truths about what enables us to succeed. Now, truth number one is, you got fear in your heart always, and you can't defeat it. Everybody's like, well, that's a bummer. The problem is, ladies and gentlemen, is you're wired for fear, right? It's part of our lives. We have it in what we do for a living, right? You talk about fear in your lives and your personal lives with your family. Folks, we've got fear, period. So what you have to learn to do is embrace it. Truth one. The second one is self-confidence is huge, it's important, and you gotta forge it every single day. The third one is you gotta live with purpose. If you don't have purpose in your life, you don't have momentum. You don't have anything driving you forward, anything pulling you out of bed every single day. And the last one, and the one I learned <laughs> that left an indelible mark, not only in my heart, but in my soul, on those beaches across the street, the street over there, is nobody does it alone. There's not a single person in this whole room right now that can raise their hand and say, you know what, Rudd, I've done it by myself. Not a single person out there has helped me, not a one. We all need help. So as a result of that, you have to recognize that you have to live what I call a team. You have to be 100% focused that everything you think about, everything you do, is with someone else, is with a team. Amen, right? We've been giving everything we are to our communities, to our families, to our children. But more importantly, we're willing to give everything we are and potentially everything we will ever be for the man that's next to us. This is the team life. This is what my mission here is today, is to help you understand this standard, to help you redefine your understanding of what that mission might look like for you. Are you working on it? Are you working on it right now? Did you work on it today? Are you gonna go work on it tonight? Because I tell you, with those three things, you're on the road to commitment. I've worked with every kind of person there is on this planet. We all bleed red. What I care about is there's something that gets you out of bed every morning. There's something that you have faith in that's bigger than yourself. There's something that you're willing to sacrifice for another human being. That's powerful.